I'll tell you a story to end this. This is one of the great stories of mankind, and it's, it's not... This isn't the only variant of this story. There's many variants of it, but... But this variant is useful for, for our purposes. It's a story I stumbled across a long time ago. I'm going to tell you the second story first, because I don't have the energy to tell you the first story. So, this is a story that the ancient Egyptians predicated their society on. And to understand this story, the first thing you have to know is what the characters were. And these characters were gods. There's four of them. Although the Egyptians had far more than four gods. You might think of these as the central gods. And you might think, what is a central god? And then you might think, well, imagine that the gods compete for dominance across time in people's imaginations. And some gods win. And they occupy the primary position of dominance in the hierarchy, in the dominance hierarchy of gods. And those are ideals. And ideals compete across time for dominance. And they're embodied. And so when diverse tribal people come together, they throw all their gods into the ring and they fight across time and something emerges as a victor. And that's the emergence of monotheism out of polytheism. And it, it parallels the development of a unified morality in, within each of us as we develop across time. And the, the god that emerges as dominant across time bears a substantial represent... a substantial resemblance. Imagine you have a set of gods in this locale that are competing across time and something emerges as dominant. And then over here you have another set of gods that compete across time for dominance and something emerges. You'll see major commonalities across the two things that emerge. And the reason for that is because the emergent... the process of emergence that gives rise to both of them is similar in both situations. And that's part of what accounts for the cross-cultural similarity of high-order religious ideas. All right, anyways, you need to know the characters. Osiris. Osiris is the old king. He's Dumbledore for all intents and purposes. He's the old king. He's the, he's the, the spirit that established the Egyptian state when he was young. He was a great hero, but now he's old. And he's, will, he's archaic and he's willfully blind. That's Osiris. He has a brother, Seth. Seth is Set. And Set is Satan, because the word Satan comes from the word Seth and Set via the Coptic Christians. So, so, so he's a precursor to the Western idea of Satan. You have Isis. Isis is queen of the underworld, and Isis was the goddess of a religious structure that prevailed across thousands and thousands of years. Isis. And you have Horus. Horus is a falcon. And the Egyptian eye, everyone knows that eye, right? The eye with the open pupil, that's Horus. And Horus is a falcon because falcons can see way better. They can see better than us, they can see better than anything else except for perhaps eagles. And they fly above everything. Zazu in the Lion King is Horus, right? And Mufasa is Osiris, and Scar is Seth. And there's no specific representation of Isis, but the closest there is in that story is probably the Queen of the Hyenas that's played by, uh, who's the actress? Um, hmm? Whoopi yes, Whoopi Goldborg, that's right, that's right. Because she, they inhabit, she's like the Queen of the Underworld, right? She's the Queen of the Hyenas that live out among the death, but... Okay, anyways, Seth, Osiris, Seth, Isis and Horus. Here's how the story goes. Osiris is a great king. He established the Egyptian state. You could think about him as the embodiment of, the, of Egyptian custom and tradition. You could think about him as the thing that the pyramid represents. All right? But he was great when he was young, but he's not young anymore. He's old. And he's willfully blind. And what that means is that he doesn't see what he could see. He refuses to see what he could see. Why is Osiris old and willfully blind? Because that's what culture is. It's a paternal spirit that's old and willfully blind. And it's always that way. Always that way. And the reason for that is because it's a construction of the dead. 
The dead aren't alive, they can't, so they're out of date, they can't update themselves anymore. And you inhabit their corpse, and that's actually what happens in an earlier story that I'll tell you next week. The, the, the early Mesopotamian gods inhabited the corpse of their father, roughly speaking. Anyway, so Osiris was great and, and when he was young, but he isn't young anymore, he's old and he's willfully blind. He won't look where he knows he should look. He doesn't have the energy, or maybe he doesn't have the spirit. His brother Seth is not a good guy, and Osiris knows it, but he underestimates his malevolence and power, and so Seth wants to rule the kingdom. So what does that mean? It's easy. Every stable society is, is threatened by willful blindness and malevolence, always. Every bureaucracy has that proclivity to stagnate and to become blind. That's why corporations die all the time. That's why a, a Fortune 500 company only lasts 30 years. It's why we have to have elections. It's to stop the dead from staying in control for too long. Seth, Osiris turns a blind eye to Seth. Seth is happy about that. Same thing happens in the Lion King, roughly speaking. Seth one day waits for Osiris to make a mistake and to be weak, and he attacks him and he chops him up into pieces. And he distributes the pieces across the entire Egyptian state. In fact, the Egyptians regarded their provinces as pieces of Osiris' body. Okay, so. Now, you can't kill Osiris because he's a god, and why is he god? a god? Because he represents the spirit of structure, and there's always structure, it can't be destroyed, it always reconstitutes itself, it can be <laughs> hurt and broken into pieces, which is exactly what happens to Osiris. Things fall apart, why? Because they get old, and because malevolence undermines them. That's what the Egyptians were trying to sort out. Okay, so, Seth distributes his Osiris all over Egypt, so he can't get himself back together. Right? Things fall apart, and they can't be brought back together. But the spirit of Osiris still lives in the pieces. So what happens? Order is demolished. What would you expect? Chaos emerges. That's Isis. Isis is queen of the underworld. She's Osiris' wife. Order and chaos, just like the yin and the yang. Order collapses, up comes the queen of the underworld. She's looking for order. Chaos cries out for order. She's looking for order. She goes all around Egypt trying to put Osiris back together. It's a state of chaos. She finds this phallus. She makes herself pregnant with it. And what does that mean? Well, it means it's like, it's like Geppetto in the belly of the whale. That thing has the potential to reemerge. The, the, the thing that collapses into its pieces is still alive. It, it can unite with the chaos and produce something new. That's the story of the dissolution of structure into chaos and then its revivication. Isis makes herself pregnant. She goes back down to the underworld. She gives birth to Horus. Horus is the Egyptian eye. He's the son of the great father and the great mother. He's a, he's a messianic figure. And in fact, much of the mythology that described Horus was extracted without much modification, and then attributed to Christ. Very much, and you, you can read about the parallels, you can read about it online if you want. But there's any number of parallels, and of course, there is the mythology that the Jews came out of Egypt, and of course the Christians emerged from the Jews, and so there was a, a tremendous influence of Egyptian thinking on the development of these later ideas. And you see pictures of Isis with Horus on her lap, that are virtually identical in content and form to the later pictures of Mary with the infant Christ. And that's the holy mother of God in the hero. It's, it's not a Christian motif. It's far deeper than a Christian motif. It's a human motif. So Isis, queen of the underworld, gives birth to Horus. And Horus grows up outside the kingdom. Why? In the underworld. Because that's what human beings do. You're alienated from your culture. Always. Why? It's old and dead and corrupt. And so that leaves you growing up in chaos. Uh, what would you call, alienated from your fundamental culture. That's the story of adolescence. Horus grows up. He can see. That's what differentiates him from Osiris. That's why he's a falcon. He goes and has a fight with Seth. And now the difference between Osiris and, and Horus is that Horus does not underestimate Seth. He knows exactly what he's up against. He goes and has a terrible battle with him, trying to get his kingdom back. Something else that's echoed in the Lion King story. And well, Hor Horus and... and Osir or Seth are fighting, Seth tears out one of his eyes. Now why? Because Seth is the embodiment of destruction and malevolence. And no matter how conscious you are, 
If you encounter that, even voluntarily, the probability that it's going to damage your consciousness is extraordinarily high. That's why people don't do it. So the eye is torn out, but Seth is defeated, and Horus banishes him to the nether regions of the kingdom. You can't kill him. Why? Because the malevolent, destructive force that threatens states never dies. It's always there. You can only remove it temporarily. Now Horus is king. Pharaoh, king, god. He's got his eye, and so you think, well, he's going to just pop that back in his head, and then he's going to be able to lead He's going to be able to take his place at the uppermost pantheon of, pantheon of gods properly. But that isn't what he does. He takes his eye, and he goes back to the underworld. Just like Pinocchio, going into the depths to rescue Geppetto. And down there is the spirit of Osiris, who's, who's extant as a kind of half-dead ghost. And he gives Osiris his eye. Now Osiris can see. So what does that mean? You go down into the chaotic, when threatened by malevolence, even to the point of damage to your consciousness, you go down into the chaos and you find the dead spirit of your tradition, and you give it vision. And so, provided with vision, Osiris regenerates, and then Osiris and Horus go back up to, to, to the world, linked together and rule jointly. And the Egyptians believed that the Pharaoh, who had an immortal spirit, was the embodiment of the conjunction of Horus and Osiris. And that's what gave him sovereignty. And so you think about how brilliant that is. The Egyptians are trying to puzzle out who should lead, who should be Pharaoh, and what do you have to be if you're going to be Pharaoh in order for things to work. You have to be awake to malevolence and chaos, and you have to embody your tradition. And that puts you at the highest pinnacle of the dominant structure. It's, and that's the same as, it's the same thing. It's the same thing as the battle between the gods across centuries or eons, and the emergence of the highest possible moral virtue as a consequence of that competition. It's the eye on the top of the pyramid, right? It's, you know, in the Washington Monument, there's a cap on the Washington Monument. The top of the Washington Monument is a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid is a cap. It's made out of aluminum. And the reason it's made out of aluminum is because when they made the Washington Monument, it was the most valuable metal known. And so what does it mean? It means there's a pyramid, and there's something at the top of it. But the thing that's at the top of the pyramid isn't the same as the rest of the pyramid. That's the thing. The pyramid exists, there's a dominance hierarchy, something climbs up to the top, but it's not just at the top of one pyramid, it's at the top of all of them. The thing that rises to the top of any given pyramid is the same thing that can dominate all pyramids. It isn't good enough to be the best at a dominance hierarchy. What you want to be is the best at the set of all possible dominance hierarchies. Right. And that's the thing that's gold at the top of the pyramid, and that's the eye. That's what the Egyptians figured out. And what does that mean? It means the thing that puts you at the top is attention. Pay attention. Keep your eyes open. It's not the same as thinking. It's not the same thing. It's like watching. And the thing about human beings is, we can see. We can see better than any other creature except birds of prey. And so our capacity to see is, in fact, what we use in the world. Our brains are actually organized around vision, unlike most animals. Their brains are organized around smell, not us. We can see. We stand upright so we can see a long distance. And in our ability to see is what saves us and what saves our communities. And that's what these stories are trying to portray. And you might say, well, why didn't people just say so? And the answer to that is because they didn't know. It took a long time to figure it out. Forever. It's taken forever to figure it out. It's, it's part of what I hoped when I wrote this book, and, and part of the reason that I'm teaching it is because it seems to me that it would be useful for everyone to actually understand this, instead of just having it told as a story. It's like, that's great, man. Yes, you need the story. But why not also just understand it? So. 
Well, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand this. So, that's good enough for today.